Chapter three, this is global marketing. So effectively, this is another one of the chapters that's the overview and sampler, because we have a full-fledged subject area of global marketing, international marketing, and international business. So what you're getting in this chapter is a taste for an entire discipline. Now with markets strategy, it's still mostly part of marketing. With global business and global marketing, we're crossing the field. So if you have a background in global business, or if you're thinking about doing global marketing, this is basically your introduction. The other thing to be aware of in this chapter is that we're going to see the first significant recurrence of marketing thought. One of the things about the way marketing is wired is that we see a lot of content that crosses over. And what we're going to see in this particular slide series is that the marketing strategy ideas also apply but are adapted to the global marketing environment. So again, at this point, we're still at the focus on what is it that the firm does? What is it that we as the marketer and our organization, what do we have the capacity to do? And the interesting thing with global marketing, if you think about it from a capacity point of view, is are you in a position to address an international audience? And if you are, is that a decision that you want to undertake? Because one of the things that you'll find a lot of discussion about in the contemporary marketing environment is the idea that simply because you have access to the internet, it means that you're a global you're now in the global economy and you're a global firm. But if you can't move your product to international buyers, are you really an international firm? And we actually see this a little more than you'd suspect in the technology and the IT areas, and also in things like TV, movie, and video. Because if you've ever loaded up YouTube to be met with a black screen and the content is not available in your region, then you understand that you can be as global as you like, but you can't necessarily always get your distribution channels together. So let's look at the playing on the global stage. Now, again, global marketing looks at this from one of two ways. Either you are looking at it from the point of view of, I am an international, I'm a firm with an intention towards the international, or I am a firm for whom I have a market where I think the international players are going to come to me. For the most part, we're going to focus on the outbound, looking at it from the point of view of, I have an organization I wish to conduct business in another country. We'll see one of the problems and challenges of looking at an area like global marketing is that you get a lot of ethnocentric thinking in the way that the papers are written, the way that the research has been conducted, and the way in which we look at the other country. Now, if you're in New Zealand, or America, or Canada, Australia is an international market, and it's a foreign market with foreign firms, and there's all sorts of elements that you need to address. But when you read the international marketing theories, that tends to come to this idea of that the foreign markets are markets like China, which is fine because if you're in America writing paper, China is a foreign market. If you're in China selling to America, America is the foreign market. But a lot of the literature has a sort of default understanding of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, UK, and America tend to present themselves as the domestic markets and the rest of the world as the foreign market. So be aware of that when you're looking at um, how things are written up and how things are presented. Reasons for getting involved in the global marketplace is, well, top of the list, that the world is actually a global economy. There are a lot of impacts. A change in currency can have a knock-on effect throughout domestic and international markets. And one of the areas that I'm really keen for you to look at this semester is the kickstarter.com and really look at the Kickstarter websites 
That is a global platform that an Australian firm can put up a Kickstarter and sell into hundreds of different global markets. The trick is getting the final product to those global markets, and that's where the challenges come in. And one of the things that's been useful for me professionally as a marketer has been to back a whole series of Kickstarter projects from around the world and to watch the logistics and distributions challenges that they've been undertaking. Things like product labeling, where they have to label the country of origin of the product, which when they were setting out as a domestic product that was going to be sold into their home domestic market, the country of origin wasn't as important as a labelling because, well, of course it was made here. When the logistics of the operation went from, well, we can get it done locally to, well, we're going to need to go to a major producer, so we're going to have to go offshore, to now that we're going offshore, that means import, and that means a whole bunch of different rules are now in effect. So it's quite interesting watching uh, even people who intended to be local, domestic economy players, suddenly find themselves getting globalized because it was simply easier to go to an offshore provider. Also on this play on the global stage is if you're on the internet and you're using PayPal, you're buying from Amazon, you're getting custom materials printed at Zazzle.com, you're buying on eBay.com rather than eBay.com.au, or you're finding that the product you can't get your hands on on Amazon.com is will ship to you through Amazon.co.uk, you are a global consumer. So we're looking at this from two ways. We're looking at it from the global marketer's perspective, but there's also the needs to be thinking about being a global consumer. Now in terms of picking a market, this is where I really want to emphasize that we're going to go back and look at marketing strategy and existing marketing thinking here. When you are looking at what it is that you want to do, you know, do you want to go into a foreign market? Do you want to go expand into a market? This is marketing strategy. This is new. This is an existing product for a new market. So you're making the same sort of decisions you'd make as a marketer saying, well, what's my pest analysis say? What's my SWOT analysis say? What does the market look like? What, do I have a competitive advantage in this market? What are the cultural conditions that this target market has and how does my product fit? So you're looking for product market fit. One of the aspects that I want you to be really aware of is that there is, again, a language and thinking around global marketing that starts to take segmentation to this incredibly meta top level approach. So instead of saying, well, my market segment is 18 to 25 year olds who have a disposable income of 25 to $35,000 disposable income after uh, bills and everything else are paid for the year. Suddenly when we go to global marketing, people are talking about, well, China or sell to China. It's like, which market in China? Like if you say, oh, I'm going to sell to Australia, my first question is going to be, yeah, where? What market? And we see this a little bit in global marketing where people start talking about countries as markets rather than talking about markets in countries. So when you're looking at this, the other thing to consider is that the foreign market decision model, it's not a bad decision model in its own right. What are the cultural environment you're going to go sell into in a domestic market? What are the market conditions? How's the economy look and what's your best telling you? So don't forget that you can cross over international marketing ideas and domestic marketing strategy. And particularly, please do not think that there is a single homogenous market in another country. There is no such thing as a single homogenous market. If you think like that, you deserve all the failure that comes to you. If you think in terms of where are markets like mine, 
that I want to address what nations can I find them in and where can I find them in those nations? What parts of that nation? Because if you say to me, oh, look, I'm going to sell them to Europe, then the question is, which language? There's a lot of European nations to work with. If you were then to go and say, well, okay, I'll sell them to America, I could equally say, which language? There are several languages to choose from. If you want to sell them to Canada, it's going to have to be English and French, and Canadian French at that. So there are always opportunities to customize, there are always opportunities to narrow your market focus. And this is what, when you look at this foreign market decision model, think like a marketer, think segmentation, think what can I do to narrow down and specify who I want to address. Now a couple of technical terms, we're going to talk through uh, three different technical terms. The born global, this is an interesting uh, concept of the idea, particularly the internet's really made this a more feasible prospect, particularly for software services, hosted services and customized print on demand, that you can set up from the outset that you are going to address the world as and markets within the world. You're going to have distribution channels, you're going to have logistics that allow you to address markets from around the globe. A lot easier if you're dealing with software, a lot harder if you're dealing with big capital objects, but still at the same time it's one of these decisions that you can look at from the point of view of saying, I want my market segment to be lifestyle, income, behavioral, but not geographic. So you can actually do this and when we come to segmentation we can look at it from the point of view of saying who needs this product? What are their defining characteristics? Do we have to bind it to a geography to make it successful in the first instance? Alright, the competitive advantage. Again, when we talk about uh, recurring themes, competitive advantage is one of the themes that's required in many aspects of global marketing, there is a competitive advantage of being international and there's a competitive advantage of being domestic. If you are trading on the basis of your nation's identity, and this is where we talk about concepts such as the country of origin effect, where coming from a particular nation gives you a certain credibility, or pretending to come from a particular nation. We've seen this a couple of times where New Zealand firms have put on international style names and languages so that they can appear to be say German in origin. And the Fisher Paykel uh, incident where in fact they're not from the nation they pretend to be. The thing about a competitive advantage is that it is very much a basic marketing strategy. What is it you are offering and why is it better than what is currently in the market? In one aspect, as a competitive advantage, you can be cheaper because of the international, because of the currency exchange perhaps. You can, on the flip side, also position yourself as more expensive and therefore luxury, a uh, luxurious good because you're an international product. You have an air of mystique and rareness because you are not produced locally, it's harder to source your particular product. Flip side is that you can have a difficulty maintaining uh, supply to meet the demand that you've created because you're not produced locally, there are shipping costs, there are delays. So again, there's no good or bad, there's no inherent benefit. What you want to be looking at is to say, as an international firm going into this market, what do we bring with us? What's the leverage that we can take from being international to make ourselves competitive? That said, if you're going to go play in an international field, you're going to go deal with other people's countries, other people's governments, and other people's commercial interests. Protected trade is a really important facet here. There are so many different agreements, defensive aspects, it's an area that I'd like you to look at in the textbook, because I think the textbook does a good job of explaining it with the examples. But I also want you to consider the idea that even for a born global firm, you are still going to have to deal with 
the country in which you incorporate will have its particular rules. The countries into which you are attempting to sell will have their rules. And we have things like uh, one of the items of protected trade in Australia is for our television. TV content in Australia has a minimum Australian local content law. Consequently, a piece of protected trade is that we have to have a domestic TV industry and that we can't completely import our television. At the same time is that the TV, domestic TV we're creating may not necessarily be useful for export, particularly if we are trying to export into another nation who has equally protected. So you want to look for that. You also have uh, legality issues of embargoes. The UN has a shopping list of people who you can't trade with. You may regard that as the ideal shopping list of people to trade with. Good luck on that front. Good luck and good lawyers. Or it may in fact be one of those frustrations where your software can't be made available because there's an embargo or a prohibition on its ownership or use in a particular country. So you have to put in geo a whole series of geo locks or your license agreement. And this is a particularly interesting one. Your license agreement may not, with uh, content, may not cover a particular country or may be prohibited to a particular country. If you look at, if you've ever actually read uh, the end user license agreements on a lot of software, it will tell you that if you are in the following list of nations, could you please delete your software and not download it again? Because technically, Apple isn't allowed to distribute iTunes to a nation that's under embargo by the US. How you actually stop that is you ask politely on the end user license agreement. You can't really stop it. All right, let's talk global market environment. Again, pest analysis. Back in play, it's a classic and it's an important facet. There are some difficulties in terms of getting data, getting information. But that also should flag in the pest analysis. If you are trying to scan an environment and you're coming up short on statistical information, economic information, or public information, that puts your social, your economic, and your political red lights on. Because political, is the government making this information readily available, or is the government making this information go away? If this is not being made readily available by intention or by accident, this is not necessarily government who's up for uh, free international trade. If the information is being copiously made available, this is a government that is trying to encourage international trade. So both your political and your economic lights up. So your environment scanning should also feed not just the raw material, but the ease of access to this material. Was it hard to understand? Was it hard to find? Was it difficult to engage? Was it written in a whole series of languages that you were unfamiliar with? Well, that starts lighting up your SWOT analysis as well. Can we understand the market we're dealing with? No, well, that's a weakness. Are we conversant? Do we have all the information we need to know? Well, that's a threat. So be aware of this. Use your pest analysis carefully when you're doing the global market environment. Again, also think not just in terms of do I get the data, but how was the data collection? Let's talk a couple of the key factors uh, for economic health. If you listen to politics in the last two, 18 months, GDP, GNP, people, the economic health indicators are interesting. Again, we've got a lot of subjects on economics. Have a look at the textbook for this one. What you're really wanting to know, though, is what does this mean for your firm? If the GDP figures are widely available and we're starting to see a sense of information about that country, you also want to be seeing how it's being described in the local politics. Because balance of trade, various figures are economic tools but they're also political tools. So you can have a treasurer who can be talking up their economy as open for business, quote unquote, or you can have an economy being talked down. The numbers may not be that 
different. The numbers may not actually objectively match the politics, but the politics will create and influence the perception in the audience. And it's the target markets. So economic health indicators are interesting, they're useful, but they should also be tied to, well, what's this impact on my target audience? Political and legal environments, governments are always fun. Uh, government risk is also an issue. You basically have your government of your home base and the government of whoever you're trading with. And your government can occasionally put you right in the deep end of it by saying something stupid to the country you wanted to trade with and the country you want to trade with starts putting up the barriers and says, well, we're not dealing with you. This was a major problem in Europe during most of the 1980s. So a little history lesson here is trade embargoes flew thick and fast through Europe that pretty much were largely based on who had recently insulted who, and it was a bit feudal with the emphasis on feud, but it was still a very real facet of if you were a British company trying to sell into France and the French government had recently been insulted by the British government, you could pretty much guarantee that you wouldn't be met with hostility at the border, hostility on the streets, and discretionary taxing and discretionary problems that the government, the French government created to pay you back for being insulted by the British government. It hasn't gotten that much better. I'd love to tell you that as a society we've evolved in the past 30 years, but it's still on. The other thing about the political and legal environment is the legal environment's really important to look at the stability. How frequently are the laws changing? What are the laws changing in response to? Are the laws changing in response to whims? Uh, Australia is actually prone to that. That's one of the things to watch for is that state governments in Australia will pass laws because there were a set of banner headlines in the local press and suddenly there's a law to address that issue. So watch for that. Political decisions as well, we're looking at uh, the opportunity to make big sweeping statements to suddenly be appear to be doing something to regulate advertising, to regulate content, to regulate product. Again, for the global environment, Australia's R18 classification on video games was one of these facets where we were seeing local state governments blocking a national policy which would have brought us in line with international standards. So one person in one electorate in one state wanting to appease his local lobby groups made the whole legal system hit a blocking point. So this is one of these things where you've got to be looking at it and when you're looking at it internationally, you're looking at it critically, you've also got to look at it critically domestically. What is also likely to happen domestically in terms of the laws that allow the content that you can create locally that might be legal or the content that might be legal internationally that is not legal or has different uh, statutory requirements locally. Even down to little things like in Australia, there are regulations governing the amount of caffeine content in a soft drink that differ from the amount governed in New Zealand that differ from the amounts that are legal for use in the US. So an energy drink that's pushing the envelope here in Australia is a mid-strength brew in the US and to the lower end of ordinary and average in the UK and in New Zealand. So your local law, which binds what you can create locally, can actually put more restrictions on what you can do than what can be uh, what is legal in your international markets. So be looking for your tensions between where you want to sell into and what you're allowed to do locally. Cultural environment, this is a really huge part of all forms of market segmentation. It's frustrating to see it always presented as, culture is presented as a thing that happens in other people's nations, and cultural environments are things that happen in other countries. They're not, they're domestic. It's international. It's one of these things that everyone has a culture, and everyone has a local culture. And everyone's local culture has 
deeply held beliefs about the way life is to be lived, which doesn't tie up with someone else's culture. That's the nature. So you've got to understand the customs characteristics of your domestic market and your international market. And the trick here is occasionally you can actually understand your domestic markets, a market segment of expatriates who are from whose cultural values are still as strong for the country they've come from. And the best example of this is if you go to London, you can find the Australian Quarter, where a bunch of Australians, now they have, might have been there three, five, ten years, will be found in November getting together to watch the Melbourne Cup. That is cultural values, a collectivist cultural niche in the UK by a bunch of Australians. Also, if you hear Australians complaining about a lack of Vegemite and it's been 20 years since they've been home, it's time to adapt to the local food. So you have the expatriate markets in your own country. You have the expatriate markets from your own country overseas. And you have the overseas markets, all of which the cultural trades. The other thing is the idea of the collectivist versus individualist is a wonderfully Western concept of being able to broadly brushstroke other nations as collectivists, individualists, except this doesn't apply at a cultural, social level. This is market level. In the United States, the home of the so-called individualistic culture, it's really remarkably easy to sell tribal behavior and tribal belonging to everybody who's sitting in the 110,000 seat stadium watching a college football team because they all went to that college, they're all wearing that college jersey, and they're all collectively holding the same values of that college. So if you treat it as a niche rather than a cultural, treat it as a market segment characteristic rather than a country characteristic, you have a lot more luck with collectivist and individualistic. Where it really comes into play is when we start talking about product benefits, when we start talking about core value of products and we start talking about communication. If you are dealing with a market niche and a market segment that is collectivist, selling individuality is a really bad idea. Norms and customs, again, one of these things where we go and talk about it as if it only happens overseas when we write, when we write global marketing texts, it happens everywhere. Basically, it's another um, consumer behavior, market segmentation aspect to be thinking about. Convention, custom, and norm. This is basically one of the things where a home ground advantage of having a local will make it a lot easier. It's actually surprisingly easy to put a bunch of Australians offside by breaching a series of cultural norms. Top of the list is in terms of cultural norms, it's not actually respecting certain public holidays. There's a lot of disrespect shown to various holidays, which is also a cultural norm. You've got to be seen to be a uh, long weekend, you know, not really taking it seriously, not really feeling like, yeah, Queen's birthday weekend, important weekend. But you have a go at Melbourne Cup Day in Melbourne, and you're in a world of trouble. Now, the fact Melbourne Cup Day doesn't get celebrated as a public holiday outside of Melbourne is also an interesting facet that suddenly Melbourne Cup Day is this very important race that stops the nation as a public holiday in one state. Everyone else has to go to work. But those cultural norms then about on that day when the horse race is on, it's completely acceptable for people to wear hats that would never be seen in the workplace any other day of the year. So we've got these weird norms and customs that if you're not familiar with them, you can run yourself into some, uh, some problems. So cultural norms and cultural customs are a home ground advantage to whoever's in that market. Which means this can help you decide about how important these facets are to your product, to your firm, to your branding, and that will help make a decision in terms of how you're going to go into that global market. The etherist Ethnocentrism, the ethnocentric emphasis, 
This is a polite way of saying that racism is a feature you can sell. And that's a tragic thing, but it, it's a thing. If and we haven't resolved it. So one of the other things about global marketing is it's really easy to fall into stereotypes, it's really easy to start running into cliches, and it's really easy to start holding racist views in the name of making a dollar, yen, or Deutsche Mark, because you're thinking about people as artificially clustered together blocks that will react in a similar manner, and that's quite often the foundation of the stereotype. So watch your market segmentation here. Also, watch your ethnocentric approach of running campaigns for the express purpose of saying we're not international is a defensive. It creates a barrier, but at the same time you're also looking at it from the point of view of what is happening in that market that makes a very don't buy that international product facet um, a feature that you can sell on. So you want to, if you see a rise of ethnocentrism, you want to look at that market and possibly run your pest and SWOT analysis on it again. All right. Now the market entry strategies. This is where we get to see some elements that are basically marketing strategy decisions, and they've got slightly different names here. Each of these has its own particular role and value, and it's one of these elements that I want you to look at in the, it's going to be looked at in class exercises, it's going to be looked at in the textbook. Give it a close look in the book because these five give you a decision-making framework. And it's a way to think through, and it's a way to look at things. But basically, you're looking at it from the point of view of commitment, risk, and control. But you're also looking at it from the point of view of what from a marketer's perspective, gives me the competitive edge. Now, if I'm in a country that's got a lot of cultural norms that are really hard to get right if you're not from that part, you want to be looking at what's my best strategy that lets me have someone on the ground who's familiar with the local environment that can help me out here. Do I buy in? Do I, or do I look at it, okay, it'd be a nice market, but I just can't deal with it. I, I don't have the organizational capacity to customize, tailor, and tweak my offering to fit that market. So give these a look over. The key ones, a couple of ones to talk about, the exporting, basically you make it and sell it and send it out right. You can be export by accident, which is where you have a predominantly domestic uh, market viewpoint, but you have a website and you're willing to post anywhere in the nation. And you, so you're up that too, look, sure, you pay the postage, I'll send it to you and you're um, a de facto exporter. Contractual arrangements set you up so that you have the franchise agreements or the license agreements. The two are similar, but basically the franchising does give you some advantages in terms of, if you look at your McDonald's operation, that the franchise gets the brand, the reputation, and the backup from the home country. Franchising can also be a problem for the core firm because you still have an investment stake. And we're seeing this uh, quite a bit with Australian firms that rapidly expanded overseas, went for a big global approach, global franchises, and it didn't get the traction so that the financial problems are coming home to roost to the home country. So in fact, an Australian country, an Australian domestic firm, there's been a couple of juice companies, a couple of coffee companies, a couple of pie companies who were doing well domestically went overseas, put the franchises up and it was a bit of a disaster because the Australian market is different and the Australian product offerings didn't connect with their international markets and now they've got a significant financial problem that's threatening to wipe out these previously successful domestic Australian firm. So it's not a no-risk strategy. The other element here when we're looking here is the strategic alliance teaming up with the local and coming up with the most obvious thing that's been said in the marketing slide and thus far. The strategic partners need to be chosen carefully. All business partners need to be chosen carefully. 
The direct investment. This is the buyout. This is where you go, hey, that firm's doing well. I will have one, thanks. Direct investment has a lot more rules and laws on it uh, and also tends to have a lot more hostility. It's kind of interesting that if you have a successful domestic firm and an international buyer comes in to buy it out, whilst the fact that that firm can still be buying local, using local products, employing local people, paying local taxes, it suddenly ceases to be that nation's firm. And there's a lot of there's a lot of xenophobia that you can drive around this. So if you want to make a buck from xenophobic, ethnocentric things, look at direct investment competing against people who are getting bought out by international firms, if you feel like being that sort of rat bag. I have a particular um, ideological position on this, which you don't have to share, but basically, the thing to be watching for this is that direct investment might seem on the surface to be the best way but it could actually damage the core brand that you're trying to buy, making your investment actually less valuable. Okay, product level decisions, going internationally. Look, this is a four piece decision. This is a marketing mix decision. So this is also gonna be something useful for one of your later exercises, where you're actually having to think about decisions for the marketing mix. First question is the product. Is the product you're going to offer, well, is it actually a value? And this is a significant facet. If you're going to sell a product into another market, does the market care about it? Now, the market could be financially valuable. It could have a whole lot of other reasons that you want to be involved. But if it's not valuable, leave it alone. If your product's not going to have value there, there's no point in making the offer. So watch that. Do you need if you need to modify your product, is it how much modification is required and which of the ANSOF squares are you now in? If you go on from I'm going to sell an existing product into a new market to I have to significantly modify this product for it to work in that new market, therefore I'm on diversification. Quite a lot of people fall for this. They look at an international market and think, ah, oh, existing product, just got to tweak it a bit, new market. And they're going in on the wrong strategy. Actually, the customizations they've got to do make it diversification. So watch that. The product appeal, the distribution, and the price. Now, price is one of the absolute killers at the moment. It used to be that you could take an ordinary product, say in the UK, a brand that was mass produced and mass distributed, so it was a low and cheap product in the UK, ship it out to Australia and make it a high end luxury. There's a brand of shirts that were called Boy London. In Australia, they were going for $120 a shirt. If you're in the UK, you could pick them up for five pounds a piece because they were disposables. But they were just because they were disposables. They were quite commonly seen in the UK club scene. They were worn, they were cheap, so they were worn by struggling bands and the underground aspiring artists. So outside of that circuit, outside of the knowing you could get it for a fiver, they were associated with these up and coming underground hipster bands, hipster movements. So in other nations, you could sell them at a significant premium because they were, had a much better brand association with these elite scenes in foreign countries. Once global marketing and the internet kicked into gear and you could actually find out that your Boy London shirt you were going to drop $120 on was worth five pounds, or 12 for 50 pounds with postage, they lost their market. They lost their premium pricing. So. The question is, can you price it differently and will you have to price it differently? And what's your gray market that you're going to make? If you're going to offer something at a base cheap price in your domestic market and then sell it as a luxury premium in international markets, people are going to fly across, load up suitcases and fly home and sell those things secondhand or repackage renewed because they're going to be able to make a profit on the difference. And that was your decision to create. 
All right, coming to the tail end of the content that's important to you, standardization versus localization. If you want to do an international marketing question, this is always a classic. Because this is very much a strategy question. It's a question that draws in product. It draws in also the sense of, whilst we're talking about this from the international point of view of localizing, modifying to the different markets, we should also be thinking about this as a domestic market option. Standardization and localization, every year at the state of origin, the Queensland versus New South Wales Rugby League event of the year, in Queensland, it's all about the maroon colouring. In New South Wales, it's all about the blue colouring. When you are in a different state and you're traveling between states, you get to see the localization really heavily influence when the product that you buy in blue down in Sydney is available in maroon in Brisbane, and it's the same firm and it's the same product. So localization is still useful to do domestically. It's, but again, it's a question. What extent does your distribution and your decision to localize and create a modified new product for a local market. So new market, new product. That's an old familiar scene you should be recognizing at this point. Product adaptation. Existing product, existing market, mostly, but you're straddling the line there. Straight extension, same product for all markets. Existing product, same market, existing product, new market. So you're looking for here new Basically, most of global marketing, you've got to be thinking about it from the point of view of it being in the ANSOF matrix square of new markets. So the question is, can you get your existing product into a new market, or do you have a new product for a new market? The other elements here that you're looking at is product level decisions, uh, costs, change, perceptions of price, and particularly globally, you, if you are the budget brand and your shipping is only available in DHL Super Extreme Express, your $5 shirt with $112 shipping is not consistent branding. So you've got to watch that. You've got to make certain that when you're looking at the total price concept, global marketing has a much greater emphasis on total price. The other questions are, will the same message work around the world? Interesting one. A lot of problematic things in this, and there's a lot of unpacking of that that can be done when we hit up promotion. But basically, why would you want to use a single message? Why would you want to use only the one advert? You're a marketer. You're targeting market segments. You're targeting people who should be responding differently. So you want to be using different triggers, different pools. You want to be going and putting out your product offer to that market with a customized promotion. You do not want the same figurehead respond in the same, if you think about your own home game domestic market, do you want to have one ad for the entire market or do you want to actually customize to get the best impact on each segment? So these are the elements you want to be looking at. Same message, or modified messages. Lastly, quick discussion of the illegal practices. Uh, look, the dumping element is basically a very problematic ethical, environmental, and other facet where we go, this has got no, no value in our home market, chuck it for cheap on someone else's shores. It's also, frankly, not the best use of your product. You're not really Thinking, this is a production sales orientation, particularly sales orientation, where it's just dump it and see if we can get cash for it. That isn't a smart use of your brand in the modern era. Grey market is an area where I think it's actually problematic that this is regarded as illegal. Uh, if you have set up a market arrangement where you are creating your product in one market, and you're selling it for a low price in its home market, and you're selling it for a premium in another market, you have just opened uh, yourself up to competition from yourself. As far as I'm concerned, that's a category of tough luck. 
yeah, it's illegal, but also welcome to the global environment, welcome to eBay, welcome to the fact that consumers can sell to other consumers, and if those consumers can make a profit off you, you messed up your pricing. Stop complaining, start being better at your job. So grey market, it's one of these areas, yes, it's illegal, no, it shouldn't be. Dumping, yes, it's illegal, yes, it should be. Or even, if it's not illegal, yes, it should be, because it's stupid. It harms your brand. It's not worth doing. All right, that's the content for this week. If you, As always, if you need me across the Twitter accounts, hit up Formspring, light up the email address. If you've got to come and see me, there's the booking details. Meet me. So slash Stephen Dan. And as always, I can be found on at Stephen Dan or Stephen dot Dan at anu.edu.au. And that's this week's content.